Birth and new motherhood, they're amongst the most significant experiences in a person's life. It can be an incredible and joyful time. But for some moms and new parents, the experience brings with it mental health challenges at just the time when people least expect them. Here to help shed some light on such struggles and what can be done to help, Dr. Ariel Dolphin, psychiatrist and head of the perinatal mental health program at Mount Sinai Hospital. Susan Biglieri, manager of child health and development at Toronto Public Health. Claire Kerr Zolbin, founder of the peer support system Life with a Baby. And Kate McDonald, founder of the patient advocacy site, the Reproductive Justice Story Project. Welcome to you all. It's very Thank nice you. to have you here to talk about something that's very familiar to a lot of women, including myself. Um, Dr. Dolphin, I would like to start with you. Uh, you're the clinical expert here, um, so maybe you can lay out a definition for us. Uh, what is postpartum depression? So postpartum depression uh, is a, um, an illness, a depressive illness that can come on up to, um, up to about a year postpartum. It often starts within the first four to six weeks postpartum. But that's called the baby blues, right? Baby blues is the first two weeks postpartum, okay. basically. And we don't really consider that an actual diagnosis or a mental illness. It's more of an adjustment to having a baby, your life's turned upside down, your body's turned upside down. Mm -hmm. But if, if the symptoms last beyond two weeks and around four weeks they're still persistent, mm -hmm. then we start to call it a postpartum depression. And the symptoms are feeling really sad, feeling very anxious, feeling overwhelmed, not being able to sleep despite feeling very exhausted. And then having more serious symptoms at times mm -hmm. of feeling, I just can't go on, I can't live this life, thinking about maybe ending one's life or harming the baby. That's when we're into the more serious category. And what would you call that? Is that still postpartum depression or something else? It could be postpartum depression or it could be part of a package of other things. Mm -hmm. And it's good that you mention that because I think it's also really important to highlight we talk about postpartum depression a lot, and it's out there a lot, but postpartum anxiety, various anxiety disorders are very common. Mm -hmm. There's something called postpartum psychosis, which is very rare, but very, very serious. And so there's an array of psychiatric problems that can happen in the postpartum period, mm -hmm. in addition to just depression. Um, let's look at some numbers as how it affects women in the province of Ontario. 7.5% uh, of new moms in Canada report depressive symptoms. 15% of pregnant women and new moms are affected by anxiety, as you mentioned, and related disorders. And this surprised me, uh, one in 19 perinatal deaths in Ontario are suicides. Uh, Susan, is it fair to call this a common problem? Because you don't usually hear about women who've had children um, committing suicide. And when you do, it is very surprising. It is, um, as Ariel was saying, on the more rare side, but women do have thoughts of hurting themselves, but usually that's the point where they reach out to get more support. So, Do women know to reach out, though? I think that it is part of um, when they go to do their six-week check, a lot of women check in around their mood. It's a lot, people are a lot more aware of perinatal mood disorders. Um, doctors, it's part of the Ontario prenatal record that they need to be checking in around mood in pregnancy as well as in the postpartum period. Is that something new? Because I had um, my daughter five years ago and I was never asked those questions. Mm -hmm. The prenatal record <laughs> did come out in uh, 2017. So it is, it has been incorporated into that. Uh, I think that there is a lot more awareness around perinatal mood disorders and anxiety and depression. The, when women are thinking about hurting themselves, that's more on the rare side of things, but I, our suicide is on the more rare side. Um, Claire, I wanted to get your thoughts. Is it fair to call this a common problem? So I think that there is more awareness in the health world, and I think that in, in terms of some of the stories that came out in the media recently, there might be more talk of it, but I think that the stigma for asking for help is still so high that even though moms know that maybe there is something out there that they could access, that they either don't think it's them, because the way that we describe postpartum depression, um, if you have postpartum anxiety, postpartum OCD, 
or um, anything other than depression, you won't see yourself in the way that it's described. And so you won't necessarily reach out for help. And then the fact that a lot of the main you know, mental health agencies and organizations don't really recognize maternal mental health as a part of their mandate, it further stigmatizes moms from asking for help. Um, we have a group of about 1,000 moms that are going through severe um, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And oftentimes, they go to their doctor and they're actually turned away because they, are, they tell them, this is not what you have. It's just the baby blues. It will go away. So mm -hmm. I think that while there is more knowledge of it, and we're talking about it more in terms of um, you know, stats and um, stories that are coming out, moms actually going and asking for help, they're not making that step. And I, I want to go one step further to say that it's actually quite unfair mm -hmm for us to leave the onus on moms to go ask for help when so they're you think, at their most vulnerable. So you think that it's the responsibility of whom then? I think that as a system, we need to be a bit more cohesive. Um, you know, we do testing for, you know, like various disorders during pregnancy. I know that um, I was, I had postpartum anxiety. I thought it was depression, but it was actually anxiety. And the way that I got access to help was because I had breastfeeding challenges, right? So there's a lot of different um, issues that we tackle. And I think that we need to add perinatal mood and anxiety disorders into that package. So uh, when you're pregnant, to have uh, something that tests your mood? During pregnancy and definitely during the first few months postpartum. Um, and Kay, uh, last year you launched something called the Reproductive Justice Story Project, which stemmed from a traumatic experience you had giving birth for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, so I started the Reproductive Justice Story Project after my own really traumatic birth experience. Um, can you tell us what happened? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's hard to talk about sometimes, but basically I left the hospital feeling like I'd been violated or assaulted. There were things done to me that I didn't have full input into. I didn't give full informed consent. Um, I just felt like there were things that were out of my control that didn't need to be. And it had a big effect on my mood and my mental health. Um, so I started talking to other parents. And I found out that this is way more common than I knew. But people rarely talk about postpartum PTSD. And that's what you have. Yeah. Um, Susan mentioned that there are safety nets where you know doctors are supposed to ask you, and you this was last year, right? Um, yeah, this was um, last year. But did you did your doctor ever check in with you when you were pregnant or even after? Um, yeah, I feel like I was asking for help from the start, saying like I'm not doing okay, and people were saying, oh, it's probably postpartum depression, it's probably the baby blues, and it felt for me. Um, like, I'm lucky to live here in Toronto, so there are a lot more supports than there might be elsewhere in the province. Um, and I had trouble finding help that was free and accessible and actually helpful for what I was going through. Um, you mentioned uh, the baby blues because I think it's something that we hear a lot. Um, but it's also kind of, it sounds kind of cute, right? Oh, you've got the baby blues, it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, do you think language has a role in maybe not taking women seriously when they do say that, you know, I do have something that's serious. Uh, doctor? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there are both sides to that. I think part of why we call it the baby blues is part of we want to normalize it, that it can be really hard. And as, as I mentioned before, your whole life and your body and your identity and everything is, is sort of thrown up in the air and life as you know it um, changes. And, um, and that's if everything goes well. It, w people have all those things. When there are traumatic events, which are unfortunately far too common, or other mitigating factors which put someone into a depression or into other mental health states, then, um, yeah, the language, is, the language is a challenge. But I think more than anything, it's the, um, it's the whole experience that's very, very challenging for people. And, so I'm less focused on what the language is as opposed to people not needing to diagnose themselves, but to be able to say, wait, like put up a red flag and say, wait, something's not right. Something's not going well for me now. What do I do? How can I help? And that's where I think things seem to break down for people. And we should um, also mention it's not just mothers. Uh, fathers experience yeah, this too yes, as well, Susan? For sure. So, um, 
fathers uh, experience depression when they're when their wife has gone through postpartum depression or anxiety, they are at increased risk for going through depression or anxiety themselves. And their depression and anxiety usually peaks between three to six months. So they are the ones hanging on, holding everything together. And as the mom starts to feel a little bit better, they start to, to crash. So they definitely do uh, struggle in making all those transition to being a parent. Because as Ariel said, it really is like you throw your life up and it is completely different to what it was before. Uh, maybe part of the normalization process of this discussion is that Hollywood um, seems to be talking about it. And I hope that I'm not going to spoil this movie for anybody, but I wanted to show a clip from the new Charlize Theron movie called Tully. And then when we come back, we'll talk about the clip. Um, Sheldon, could you please roll it? You seem like a great mom. <laughs> Great moms organize class parties and casino night. They bake cupcakes that look like minions. All the things I'm just too tired to do. Honestly, even getting dressed just feels exhausting. I open my closet and I just think, didn't I just do this? Um, and that clip, she's, I, again, spoiler alert, in that clip, that other person isn't there. Uh, so Tully's having, I guess, what you would call a psychotic breakdown. Um, what do we assume postpartum depression or post postpartum mood disorders look like? I'll put it to you first, Dr. Eric. What do we assume yeah. or what does it look like? Yeah. Do what think? do we assume and like postpartum depression or the moods uh, look like? Well, I think uh, people assume that they are some, I mean, I think it, it's, it's hard to generalize. I think some people come in and assume that it means that they're standing on the edge of the subway platform with their baby in their hands and they're about to jump so that it's very, very severe. Or that they don't love their baby at all. Or that they are, um, that they can't do anything. Whereas there's a whole range of different experiences. Some people come in and they say, I didn't think I had postpartum depression because I do love my baby, but I can't take care of my baby. I can't take care of myself. I'm not enjoying anything, but I do love my baby. Other people assume that um, everything's okay, that they don't have postpartum depression because they are so incredibly anxious and can't make decisions or won't go out of the house or too scared to do anything or having flashbacks or having nightmares. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, I don't have depression, so I must be okay. Something else must be wrong with me or I must be a really bad mom or I shouldn't have gotten myself into this or, you know, it's all my fault. So. You know, I, I think some of the times people mislabel themselves as not having postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they think something's wrong with them, something's crazy, and they, 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 they shame themselves and they silence themselves because they say, if I am crazy or if something's wrong, then I shouldn't reach out for help because then someone will take care away my baby from me, and that would be devastating to me. So I, I think it's, again, there's a whole range of assumptions that people make. They hold on to snippets that they see in the news or they hear about or people have told them, oh, you should just be okay. And, and then they, they silence themselves a lot of the time or they get pressure from family or from their own culture. I just wanted to add to one point that was made before in terms of um, what, you, what you were mentioning before about um, people are talking about postpartum depression is that I think there's very uneven progress that we've made in terms of uh, in Canada. I'd say, and I'll probably get a lot of hate comments for this. In what way? Sort of middle class white women. Mm -hmm. Yes, we talk about postpartum depression and it's out there and physicians are aware about it. I'd say that's not as the same across the boards in terms of different immigrant groups or religious groups or cultural groups or ethnic groups. It doesn't cut across all the areas in terms of awareness, in terms of um, self-identification. Or even access, of, maybe? In terms of access or in terms of values. I'm so, glad you brought that I up. just We're wanted to... to put that out there because I think it's it, there are very big gaps across mm -hmm. all those different We're groups. actually going to talk more about that okay, in okay. our next segment. <laughs> okay. uh, but um, Kate, I wanted to bring you in. When you did uh, realize that you, there was something going on, um, how did you realize something was happening that shouldn't be or that you needed help? I was having flashbacks all the time. I was feeling really overwhelmed and really, like it was on my mind all the time. I couldn't get it out of my head, all the stuff that had happened to me at the hospital. Because we talk about, like, we assume what postpartum depression looks like. So if you are a new mom and you're going through something, how do you know when to ask for help? Susan? I think it's a little bit different for every single mom who, who goes through that. It, 
I, I think that women um, and, and fathers I, and families as a whole try their hardest to take care of the baby and do the best that they can. Uh, and when you have a new baby, there's so many things going on. There's lack of sleep. You're not eating the way that you were before. You are not reaching out to your colleagues that you may have spoken to before and you feel very isolated. So there are, it really is, it's a little bit different for everyone. And you, I think that there's so much stigma and shame that they do keep it quiet. They don't tell anyone how, how much they're struggling. And it may be, just as in that video clip where a woman says, I don't even feel like getting dressed in the morning. I'm, I'm back at my closet and I'm doing the same thing over and over and over again. And um, you realize that you just, there's no pleasure in front of you or you're so anxious that you can't even pack your bag to get out of the house with your baby. Like, Someone will say to you, well, you just put the things in your bag, but it, you run all over, the, over your apartment looking for things and you don't know how to pull yourself together in that moment, so. Well, the, the initiative, uh, the Bell Let's Talk initiative, um, when we talk about stigma and uh, silence, uh, a lot of people have credited that initiative for opening up the conversation about mental health. Um, can we say the same about maternal mental health, Claire? No, we absolutely cannot. Um, I think for the mental health movement, I would say that maternal mental health, it's like the ugly stepsister of the movement. Nobody talks about it, no one wants to own it. Um, I said I wouldn't say this, but um, it shocks me that the Canadian Mental Health, sorry, the, the, commission, men, the Mental Health Commission of Canada does not have maternal mental health as a part of its mandate. So that is, like we are basically telling mothers that this is not a real illness. It is not recognized um, by most of the main mental health um, organizations. And it lives no place. Like, no one is focusing on this. And in terms of um, even talking about it, the stigma is there so badly that you think, well, you just had a baby. What do you have to be sad about? So it is so hard for moms to actually make that leap to reach out for help and say that I need help with something because they don't know how it's going to, um, people are going to respond around them. And I think one thing that we have to acknowledge is the fact that most moms may not even know that they have postpartum depression, anxiety, OCD until they recover. Because while you're going through it, you may not realize what's happening. Because again, like you said, it looks mm -hmm. different for everybody. It looks different for everyone. And not only that, like sleep deprivation can mimic mm -hmm. postpartum mm -hmm. depression. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we really need moms to actually be screened. It, it needs to be recognized as an illness so that they can get treatment. Because whether it's Hollywood or your mom or your friends, the idea of what this illness looks like can be completely different from the way that you're experiencing in it and you need actual medical diagnosis and treatment. And I think too, um, and not to make a generalization, I think there's this kind of, you know, with Instagram, social media, there's this kind of, uh, when you have a baby, how it's supposed to be perfect, how it's, you know, all these things yeah. are supposed to fall into places or how you, you're going to give birth. Mm -hmm. And when those things don't happen, um, I guess it would be difficult for somebody to say, this is how I'm feeling, right. again, to see that they need help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and Susan, you're with Toronto Public Health. Mm -hmm. What are you doing to help end the stigma and also to make sure that moms are being screened? And they, they do know, like you said, it looks different for everybody, but to get their awareness out that this could be happening to you. Uh, so at Toronto Public Health, we have a, a comprehensive um, plan around perinatal mental health. And so there's... Um, I'm going to say three components to it. One of them is our social media campaign. So we've run that um, actually in the subway system for the last two years with, uh, around World Maternal Mental Health Day to raise awareness around uh, perinatal mental health and to let moms know that they're not alone and that they deserve to feel better. So those have been our two um, taglines for the program. Mm -hmm. And we've done social media boosts on uh, Instagram and on Facebook to raise awareness for um, families that this is a time where it's okay to reach out uh, for help. And then from the um, province of Ontario, all new mums are to be screened in hospital um, with the parents' permission uh, to see if they need more help. So in Toronto, all mums are offered a telephone call from a public health nurse. Our difficulty is 
phones are, people don't answer their phones now. It's, uh, and we have our, when you get a call from Toronto Public Health, it's a uh, unknown caller, so mums may not pick up. But we do attempt to contact all new mums and- What about seeing them in person? And we will see them in person. So we do a telephone call first, mm -hmm. and then uh, a public health nurse can go out and visit them if uh, the mom needs more support. And then we also have breastfeeding clinics that we run around the city, and we have parenting groups that we have as well in various locations around the city, as well as um, we run a program that's called the Perinatal Adjustment Program. So that is a telephone contact with a public health nurse on a weekly basis. And then we also run support groups in uh, the southeast part of the city and in Scarborough for women that are struggling. I had my first child in England and they had a program where um, the first eight weeks they had somebody um, come visit you in your home. Mm -hmm. Do you think that could benefit moms or is that something that could happen down the line? Uh, I think that it would be something that could really help mom. So if someone is identified in the hospital who has had maybe depression or anxiety in her pregnancy, that would be a mom who that could totally happen, that they would receive a visit from a public health but, nurse. But see, you said identified, because again, yes. right, it yeah. morphs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'm going to jump in right now because I do work in a perinatal mental health program embedded uh, within the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Mount Sinai mm -hmm. Hospital. And um, so, it, unfortunately, I do think it's a bit of what we call a postal code lottery in terms of services. If people are living in a certain area, if they're giving birth at a certain hospital or a certain location or their health care provider happens to be knowledgeable and an advocate of mental health issues and knows where to send someone, that person is likely in Toronto going to do okay. If they're not, which is probably many, many Canadians, mm -hmm they're going to do less well. But I will, I just want to highlight a few initiatives that we are working on at Mount Sinai and try in, in uh, order to address some of these things. Well, first of all, we work very closely with the OBs in terms of educating them and speaking with them and collegially working on cases to get people connected to care. Mm -hmm. Um, we've also recently completed a text messaging screening project, knowing that people don't always answer their phones and everybody's on their phones for other reasons other than speaking on their phone calls to try and A, screen mm -hmm. new moms and B, push out information to them about what's normal, what's not normal and what to be concerned about and how to get help and then to loop them into care if they need to. And the other thing um, I've been fortunate to be working on with some colleagues at Women's College Hospital is really trying to improve access for women across the province in terms of a digital health um, initiative where women will be, have access to information, have access to virtual kinds of care, whether it's psychotherapy, whether it's uh, telemedicine assessment. So we are working on things um, since there is a, a big awareness that there are so many gaps in the system in terms of accessing care, in terms of screening. Um, but I think it's important to put out there that there are solutions that people who I work very closely with, as I mentioned at our hospital, at Women's College, that we are trying to address some of these, some of these, program, some of these gaps by being creative and bringing health care and mental health care into the next century. Um, we only have a few minutes left, um, but I wanted to bring in um, another clip, and this is a TED Talk by Vancouver artist and teacher Camille Mehta. Uh, Sheldon, please roll. You see, in the first year postpartum, a woman's suicide risk goes up 70%. The number one thing most likely to kill a new mom is the one thing we don't talk about. Because the leading, the leading cause of death in new mothers is suicide. The truth is that the majority of women who are struggling even right now with postpartum depression don't get any treatment at all because they are never even diagnosed. Why? Um, we only have a few minutes. Uh, it's been such a great conversation, but I really wanted to bring Kate and Clara into this. What, you, what were your experiences like uh, seeking access to care and public support systems? when you realized you needed them, when we're talking about being diagnosed? So luckily, I had breastfeeding 
challenges and you know I say that because that's the only way that I received um, help um, but it you know I did look normal to everyone um, it was just that I had debilitating anxiety but that didn't play out because I was in love with my daughter I was very high functioning um, but luckily you know I I feel like the fact that I had breastfeeding challenges saved my life because I was able to have someone come in and then she recognized that okay you need help. Um, but then just to what you said in terms of getting access to care, I, I tried going through the general route where I would have to be on a wait list. And so luckily I had extended insurance and was able to pay for my own therapist, which was $190 an hour. You know, and I was going every week for about two years um, because for me, CBT was what worked. And I think, you know, if you can't, number one, pay for your own care, then you're going to be suffering for quite a long time because the there's not a lot of services that's free and available to you unless you're like downtown core Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, and what is CBT? Is that cognitive therapy? Cognitive behavior, behavior therapy. therapy, yes. Okay. So, and um, you know, when I did reach out to different people, they just said, well, you know, like my friends were like, you have the dream life, you know. What could be wrong? Uh, so no one really took it seriously. And to what you talked about, I actually thought, and this is so embarrassing, but I used to think that I couldn't get postpartum depression because it was black. Like it just wasn't something that we talked about. So I just thought, okay, that just happens to other people. Um, so even just you know um, the way that we talk about it in our culture and in our community and different places, um, and then. What I thought postpartum depression was, was when I was a teenager, there was that lady who jumped in front mm -hmm, of the mm -hmm. TTC. And so to me, that, that was postpartum depression. Like, it never occurred to me that it was just anxiety and being unable to, to um to That function. it could present itself yes. in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. And Kate? Well, I feel like I kind of took matters into my own hands because I felt like people weren't listening to me in the way like, I felt like it was urgent. I needed this much help and I was getting like this much. And people aren't talking about birth trauma. Mm -hmm. um, so I started the Reproductive Justice Story Project and shared my story and people started sharing their stories too. And, and what do you hope to do with that? I hope that more stories will come in and that people, especially the experts who are supposed to, this is supposed to be on, on their radar, they're gonna start talking about birth trauma and especially the kind that's preventable. Um, and you hope that it can actually affect policy in Ontario, right? Absolutely, yeah, but that's not gonna happen unless we're talking about it and people who have been harmed by their care providers mm -hmm. are speaking up about it and we're starting a bigger conversation about obstetric violence in Ontario and Canada. Um, uh, one more, I've got a, one more question, but I wanted to ask Claire quickly, what is life with a baby? Okay, so Life with Baby is a peer support program which focuses on preventing moms from getting to the crisis point anyways because there's a lot of research that has shown that peer support can prevent um, postpartum uh, depression for the ones that where it's not clinical because sometimes it's just psychosocial and uh, like we said, you know, sleep, sleep deprivation and stress and some of these things can mimic um, postpartum depression. So our program basically connects moms with each other as well as their local resources. We're all across Canada. Uh, we have about 77,000 users. Um, we have 500 volunteers in 72 communities. Uh, it's something that I started based on the what I needed at the time, which was peer support, which was what really kept me going. And um, trying to focus on that preventative piece, because if we can prevent a mom from falling into crisis, that's going to affect her entire family. So um, The ripple effects are felt yes. by everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the final question is for both of you. Um, one thing the US, Australia, and the UK have done lately is recommend healthcare providers screen for maternal mental illness. Why don't we do the same here? Well, uh, as Susan mentioned, it is part of the most up-to-date antenatal record. So uh, those who are delivering babies in Ontario are meant to ask, just as they ask about any genetic history or other things. Why don't they? Uh, time. 
Um, they don't know what to do with people who screen positive, I think, more than anything. Uh, they don't want to take, they worry that if someone cries in their office, they won't be equipped to handle it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they worry that they won't know where to send someone since there is a lack of, of services in many areas. Those aren't good excuses. They're not necessarily valid excuses, but I think that's the reality of being a very busy clinician mm -hmm. and, and practitioner. And I think conversations like this and all the different sources of support and help you know, eventually will maybe move things in a way that it's uh, that it comes to the forefront more and people do take it more seriously or that more services are funded, whatever they may be. And Susan? Uh, so at Toronto Public Health um, in 2018, we have started screening all the women that we come in contact with for uh, perinatal mood disorders in pregnancy as well as in um, postpartum. Uh, one of the concerns uh, with screening is you need to have somewhere to send someone and you need to have care pathways. So we're very lucky in Toronto. We do have care pathways and we have um, resources to be able to support women. It is something that we need to be thinking about as a whole though, really. Um, I, I'm glad, thank you very much for all being here to uh, give your insights and to Claire and Kate for doing something on the ground that's helping so many women and hopefully be something that we talk more about because women in need need the help right mm -hmm. now. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank, thank, thank you. you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.